hi everybody. Uh, my name is Beth Mulcahy and I'm the senior attorney and managing partner of the Mulcahy Law Firm. And I'm so happy to be here today with the Scottsdale Neighborhood College to teach a class on amending association documents. And first, I'd just like to start out uh, by saying thank you to the city of Scottsdale for continuing to partner with our firm to provide free education to board members, managers, and owners in Scottsdale and beyond. Um, I've been partnering with the city of Scottsdale for over 15 years, and it's really been a wonderful partnership. Um, and we've provided a lot of free education and lots of questions answered for uh, many Scottsdale HOAs and condominiums. So just as a starting point, um, my background is that I have been working with associations as legal counsel or as legal counsel or attorney um, for about the past 24 years. And our firm currently represents over a thousand community associations, uh, condominiums and planned communities throughout the state of Arizona. Um, in addition to being a lawyer for associations for the past 24 years, um, I also have served for over 10 years as a board member for my association. Um, and I've also had a little stint as a disgruntled owner too. So um, I think I bring a unique perspective to these classes in that um, you know, I can give you perspective as legal counsel, solving legal problems for associations. I know what it's like to be a board member. Um, actually, my term is up in January, and I have been thinking kind of long and hard about whether I want to stay on for another three-year term. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time on the board, so I, I can give you some perspective from some of the challenges that I faced as a board member. And then, of course, I had a little stint where I was unhappy with my association. So I also really do understand if there's anybody in the audience here today that's not happy about how things are going in your association and what are some positive things that you might be able to do to make change, um, including thinking about running for the board yourself. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we have a great class planned on amending CCNRs. Um, which is a really important topic for many associations because a lot of associations in Scottsdale have antiquated association documents. And so this is a, a timely class to help some of you who may be looking at updating or amending your association documents in the next year. Uh, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about logistics on the class. Um, but remember that if you aren't able to get all of your questions answered here today during our presentation, um, you're always welcome to uh, contact us on our first Fridays, which is, we call it the free first Fridays. And it's the first Friday of every month. Um, if you contact our office at 602-241-1093, so 602-241-1093, the first Friday of the month between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m., um, an attorney from our office will answer one question at no charge. So keep that in your back pocket. We just had our uh, November first Friday uh, this past Friday, and the next one will be the first Friday in December. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about um, a COVID-19 update. Um, of course, we it's difficult to have a seminar right now um, without doing some sort of a COVID-19 update. So. Um, fortunately, we haven't had a lot of developments recently in the state of Arizona, um, but the most you know, recent information is that we have seen an uptick in the number of reported COVID-19 cases within the state. And several weeks ago, Governor Ducey held a news conference and stated that there was possibly a storm ahead of us and reminded Arizonans to continue to follow social distancing guidelines, wear a mask in public, and wash your hands often. So one of the things that I'm often asked as legal counsel for associations is what should associations expect for the balance of 2020 and maybe even the first quarter of 2021? What can we anticipate based upon you know, what we know so far? Well, I think there, there is a possibility if we're watching what's happening in Europe right now, um, that there could be future closures of common areas if the numbers continue to increase and there truly is a large storm of COVID cases in Arizona. And so just planning ahead on that, um, obviously, if, if the governor issues any executive orders, our firm will be very active on social media. We'll possibly have a Facebook Live to answer questions on any required closures that we may have. So just keep that in your back pocket that um, if there are any new uh, federal or state mandates regarding um, you know, changes that will affect associations, 
we'll be talking about them on our webpage, on our social media, and if, if necessary, and if we think it will be helpful, we'll get on Facebook Live and, and have some additional uh, avenues for you to ask questions and to provide information to you. Um, some other things that I think we can anticipate is, um, you know, that we're going to see an uptick possibly in the um, number of homeowners that aren't paying assessments. Um, and so see, there's some things that I think we can expect. Okay, so we're going to be doing our first poll that our firm's doing today of, of everybody who's on the call. And um, the first question that I have is um, on your screen right now, it's what's what has been the impact of COVID-19 on your association? Okay, so our poll results are in. So the, the results are, how has COVID impacted you? So we've had about 12% said not at all. 40% said not that much. 36% said it's been additional work, work this year, but manageable. And last but not least, 12% said it's been a very difficult year for our board. So great, that's really good feedback for all of us, I think. Um, almost everybody has felt some sort of impact, um, but it's nice to know that associations have found this to be manageable this year. So that's great. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a little bit of now about um, amending association documents, our, our topic for today. So when the pandemic initially started, um, something that our firm, a very common question that we had is, hey, is this a great time? for our association to start thinking about um, possibly doing amendments to our CCNRs um, or our bylaws or our articles of incorporation or our rules or our architectural guidelines. And so what we found is that over the past nine months, we've received a lot of questions on this. And we really anticipate that this will be a question that will continue through you know, 2021. So just some feedback, um, a question that I commonly get is, how often should associations amend their documents? Um, and you know, it, it really just depends. Um, every association is different, but a lot of associations in Scottsdale currently have CCNRs for covenants, conditions, and restrictions um, that were written in the 80s or 90s or the early 2000s. And really kind of a good rule of thumb that I'd like to start out this class with is about every decade, your association should be thinking about doing an amendment to your CCNRs. And so um, if you're an association that's sitting here listening to this presentation today and you find that, gosh, we haven't amended our CCNRs ever, or we haven't done it in the past 15 years, um, it's really ripe now for you to be taking this step so that you can bring your association's documents you know, into compliance with current laws. Um, and really kind of the first thing we can talk about is what are the most common reasons that we find for amending association's documents? So let's just go over what documents there are to be amended. Um, of course, we have the CCNRs, which are also known as the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions, the bylaws, the Articles of Incorporation, the rules of your association, the architectural guidelines. These are the most common association documents. And so what are the most common reasons that we, we think about amending the documents? Um, well, first, to get rid of restrictions that are outdated ambiguous, unreasonable, that you're not enforcing um, would be probably one of the main reasons that we see. Um, to comply with federal, state, and local laws or ordinances. So as you know, every year our legislature is passing a number of new laws pertaining to condominiums and planned communities. And sometimes those laws directly conflict with what your documents say. And so uh, you want to make sure that, you know, at least every decade you're brushing up your documents to make sure that it's not confusing if the law has changed and your documents directly conflict with that law. Um, you really want to make sure that you're updating those documents to um, reflect what the state law says. Um, another reason to amend your, your documents is to delete or modify provisions that are inconsistent with the management and operation of the association. So for example, if you have a provision in your documents that um, prohibits on-street parking, and let's say that your association has been really lax on that, and 80% of your association is parking on the street, that may be something that is no longer enforceable, and you may want to take that out of your documents. Another reason to amend your documents is to get rid of all that developer language that's no longer applicable for your association if you're post-developer control. 
Um, and a lot of times that language is confusing and it's wordy and a lot of associations like to clean that up and take that out. And then the last reason is to correct provisions that conflict with other governing documents. So, for example, maybe your bylaws and your CCNRs conflict on the number of board members that you should have for your community. Or maybe you have inconsistent provisions in your articles of incorporation and your bylaws. So I call this kind of the cleanup exception. So, you know, you want to go in and clean up your documents so that they are consistent with each other, don't conflict, and don't cause confusion for your owners. Um, first things that we kind of want to talk about are that there are a number of requirements which need to be met before you can actually amend your CCNRs. And so what our firm has done over the years, um, you know, over the past 24 years, is come up with a plan, a formula that's helpful for associations in amending their documents. And so basically we've, we've come up with a strategy over the past 24 years to help your association be successful in amending your association's documents. And we've assisted hundreds of associations with amending their association's documents successfully using this plan. Um, and one thing I just, I kind of want to mention before we go into what the plan is, is that it's a lot of time, effort, and work to amend your CCNRs. Um, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that up front. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're going to spend the time and you're going to spend the, you know, budget money for having your legal counsel help you with amending your documents, you want to be successful. You don't want to go through, um, you know, several months of creating the changes and, you know, getting support from your homeowners to ultimately have the amendments fail. And so you really want to closely follow all steps that we're going to talk about here. We have a five-step plan um, because every step has importance and we'll kind of go through each step as we're uh, progressing through this class today. Okay, so uh, step one in our five-step plan, determine what is required to amend the document. So before we start on anything, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we start out with step one. Um, and so I guess the first thing you want to do is think about, do your association's documents need to be updated? So for those of you who are listening in today, I'd like to hear just uh, you know, from all of you participating, yes or no, or I don't know, um, as to our poll here, you know, do you think your documents need to be amended? And so a couple things to think about are, are your documents really easy to understand and organized? Have they been you know, amended in the past decade? Um, these are all important questions that you'll wanna be thinking about when answering this question. So I'll give you a little time to answer the poll and then we'll give the poll results. Okay, wow. So uh, we have a lot of people today saying that their documents do need to be updated. So 74% of those of you who are participating today said yes, we do think the documents need to be updated. 4% um, said no, and 22% said, I don't know. Um, so it looks like a lot of the people that are listening in today are in the situation where you're gonna need the five-step plan. And for those of you who don't know, um, keep this in your back pocket as you determine whether or not your association may need to update your documents. Okay, so step one, uh, determine what's needed to amend the documents. So the first step you should think about are, A, what documents do I want to amend? And B, what is the procedure to amend each document? Um, so the board of directors should check the specific language of whatever document that you're trying to amend. So typically there's a provision in each document which outlines the proper procedures to amend the CCNRs, the Articles of Incorporation, the bylaws, and the rules and regulations. Now, most documents, such as the CCNRs, the Articles of Incorporation, and the bylaws, do require approval of the membership to amend. Um, typically, the rules and regula regulations are adopted by the board and don't require a vote of the membership. However, if the board is going to be voting on amending the rules or the architectural guidelines, the board should be placing in the meeting notice uh, what specifically they plan to amend so that owners can attend and listen to a meeting if they're going to be voting on amending the rules. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the most common documents, you know, that we are uh, amending or helping associations amend are going to be the CCNRs, the articles, and the bylaws. So where should we look to determine if, um, you know, 
the amendment procedure for your association. And remember, every association has different documents. So I can't just give a bright line rule today on you know, what the percentage is for a majority of associations in Arizona. I certainly can say a range, um, but typically where, where you wanna look is go to the back of the document. So go to the last five pages of your CCNRs, your articles or your bylaws. And typically there's a section entitled amendment um, and you'll want to look at that section very carefully. Um, you know, in most cases, um, you're going to see a range for the CCNRs to amend the covenants, conditions, and restrictions anywhere from, you know, as low as 51% if you're planned community to as high as 90%. Occasionally, very occasionally, we'll even see 100% of something. Um, and so you're going to want to look at each document and determine, you know, what is the procedure to amend the document. Um, as I said already, the rules typically are promulgated and, you know, voted on to be amended by the board um, without a membership vote. However, in some associations, I can think of one association in Scottsdale and South Scottsdale that actually has a requirement for um, the owners to vote on any changes to the rules, but that's pretty rare. Usually it's the board can make the decision to, to amend the rules. Um, of course, at this stage, it's really important that you loop in your association's legal counsel to give you some advice on what is required to amend the documents. And a word of caution, when you find the section that says amendment, and of course, each document is going to have their own amendment section, you have to be really careful how you read and interpret the language. Um, because sometimes you'll see, like in the CCNRs or maybe even the bylaws, there's a big difference in, in language. So for example, if the CCNRs say that you need 67% of the membership to approve an amendment, that's different than 67% of the membership present at a meeting. Um, you know, Typically the second example, if you have to get 67% of a membership that's present at a meeting, that's just 67% of a quorum um, or however many show up at that meeting. And that could be significantly lower if you have a low quorum requirement for your association. Um, in contrast, 67% of the entire membership is gonna be a higher threshold for your association. So a few words of caution, be really careful how you're reading these sections. Um, make sure that you're looking very carefully at the, the language that's being used as to the specific procedure to amend the documents. And make sure that you're confirming with your legal counsel in writing what specifically is the procedure to amend each document um, so that you're making sure that you're you know, coming up with the correct threshold as you're moving forward with getting votes. Okay, let's go to oh, one more thing I wanna mention just briefly on the Condominium Act. So, uh, you know, of course we, we listened at the beginning of this call where we were talking about how many owners and board members were in condominiums or planned communities. You have to be really careful because under the Condominium Act, um, there is a minimum threshold in order to amend CCNRs, and that would be 67% of the votes. Now, the Planned Communities Act doesn't have that. And so you want to be, this is another time where you really should be checking in with your legal counsel. Um, very occasionally, we'll see a condominium that has an amendment provision that's lower than 67%. Um, and in that case, the state law would conflict with your documents and would control in terms of the required percentage that you'd need to amend your documents. So again, just a word of caution, make sure that you're reaching out to your legal counsel to discuss what your specific procedures are for each of your association documents that you want to amend. Okay, let's talk about step two. This step is typically the longest step um, in the process of amending CCNRs. So, Step one, we figure out what, what's it gonna take for us to amend. Do we need a vote of the membership? How many people do we need? Step two is actually taking the changes and, and coming up with the changes. And so the board may wanna have a, a committee to research and prepare amendments to the association's documents, or maybe one or two board members will wanna take the lead. Um, but basically you should come up with your wish list of things that you'd like to change. Um, and the amendment committee can solicit the ideas of committee members, board members, and owners regarding the changes to the documents. Um, the committee or the individual board members who are in charge of coming up with the changes, the proposed changes, um, they can actually draft the proposed changes themselves. 
Um, but it's really important at this step to have legal counsel review the documents and, ex and assist your association with drafting the changes that you're proposing to whatever document that you're amending um, so that the documents are legally proper, are consistent with state law. Um, and lots of times I'm asked, you know, how, what do you prefer? Would you rather have um, the board or the committee uh, take a first stab at the documents and come up with the changes? Or would you prefer that they give you um, the documents as they exist right now and then have, you know, my firm, Mulcahy Law Firm, take the first stab at, at um, amending the documents? And honestly, you know, you can do it both ways. Um, you know, the board can take the lead on it or our firm can take the lead. But in perfect honesty, I can tell you that I do prefer having our firm go first. And here's why. Um, because lots of times the committee or the directors will make changes and then I have to spend time, um, you know, undoing some of those changes, um, especially if the changes conflict with state law. And so it's easier, more cost effective to have our firm um, you know, come up with the changes first. And then we provide them to the committee. And it's frankly, it's probably easier for the committee too because then um, you get the changes in a nice clean form and then you can just add on things that you specifically want to have added on. And so how do we typically handle step two? Um, basically what we do is we uh, take the document, whatever document it is that you want to amend, the CCNRs, the bylaws, the articles, or the rules, and we put it into a Word document. And then we turn on the track changes feature and we just go through, our firm will go through the document probably five or six times and we'll start making changes. So I typically, if I have a project like this, I'll go through it once quickly and maybe earmark some things that you know jump out at me as things that really need to be changed. Um, and then I'll do a more detailed review on the second and third time. The fourth time I'll do kind of like final cleanup things or if the board's given me some things that they'd like to add or they'd like me to add, um, I'll add that in probably the fourth time I'm through. And then the fifth time is just to make sure I, I didn't miss anything and to proofread everything. And so I take that document that's been amended, um, you know, with using the track change feature. And in step two, then I provide that to the board. Um, and the board typically, um, and I will maybe go back, back and forth once or twice. So I'll provide the first draft to the board. Um, and typically then the board will spend a month going through it and maybe they'll have some changes. What I ask them to do is if they are tech savvy, I'll have them, um, you know, track their changes that they're making in the document. And um, then maybe they'll send it back to me once and then I'll provide comments to them once. And then really we've got the document where it needs to be. Now, sometimes associations will say, you know, how much is it going to cost? to do a CCNR amendment. And really we can give a bid anytime we look at the documents. Um, but here's where you can really minimize your costs. Step two is typically where we have a lot of back and forth with the board. And if we're really efficient in step two, meaning that I take the first stab at the document um, and I provide it to the board, they give me their comments, they give it back to me, I provide comments again, and then I give it back to the board and we're done. If we can do it in this manner, it's gonna save your association a lot of time, effort, and money. Um, I find that the associations where we go back and forth, you know, eight or nine times, that's really where it starts to get more expensive when you're doing um, CCNR amendments. So it's just notable to, to mention. Okay, so at the end of step two, um, the board has provided comments, your attorneys provided comments, we have the document in Word format, um, and all the changes are tracked, so it's very easy to understand what's been changed, what's been removed, what's been added, um, and who's actually added or removed something. Um, so now we go to step three. Um, and so really we've done the most of the work, right? In step two, we've made all the changes, um, and it, it's really easy to see what we've changed. Now, step three is, is the step that the boards always want to skip. And basically, this step is the most important step in the entire process. And so remember when we were talking about step one, where we have to figure out what the required percentage of vote of the owners that we need in order to amend it? 
Um, and so step three is an important step uh, to provide us with feedback as to how the owners feel about the amendment. So I always suggest to boards, please do not skip step three because that helps us get across the finish line with the votes that we need to amend a document. So step three, we take the amendments that we created in step two and we take them to the community and we educate and solicit community support of the proposed changes. So there's a number of ways you can do this. Um, the board can have a town hall meeting. Maybe if, if we're still in the pandemic, you could do that via Zoom or if it's post pandemic or with proper social distancing, you could do it in person. Um, some associations have put um, the language that we're changing in newsletters, um, but almost all associations provide the printed document um, either on their website or by email or, you know, some associations still mail it by paper, um, you know, provide the owners with here are the changes that we're thinking about doing to our association's documents. What do you think? And providing owners with a, a feedback mechanism so that they can tell us how they feel about the amendments. And why is this important? Well, it's really important because we typically need a high percentage of owners to approve amendments to your documents. And so this is just a really great way to get feedback from your owners um, about how they feel about the amendments. What's controversial? What do people hate? What do people love? And, you know, for example, this is kind of a normal outcome. So if you send the documents, the proposed changes to the members, and let's say maybe 5% or 10% of your owners provide feedback, that's pretty common. Most of your owners will not provide feedback. But the feedback that you get from the 5 or 10% is really helpful in helping us determine what should be the final amendments for your association. What language should we keep? What language should we take out? What language should we maybe segregate and vote on separately? And from my experience, kind of the hot button issues for associations um, are any time that you're expanding the board's rights to um, increase assessment rates or to levy a special assessment, any time you're talking about rental restrictions, short-term rentals, um, you know, anything that's a controversial topic for your association, uh, maybe if you're trying to get historical designation through the city, um, sometimes those can be contra controversial topics. Um, if you're including language in your amendment that pertains to that, um, you're going to hear feedback from that 5 or 10% of your owners, you know, telling us that they like it or don't like it. And what we do is we take that feedback, we give typically what we'll do is we'll have like a comment form or give them an opportunity to email one person, maybe your manager, um, with their comments. And then at the next board meeting after, you know, we send out the comment form and the proposed documents, the board should sit down and discuss what the comments are with your legal counsel. And I think I've been through enough CCNR amendments, probably over a thousand for sure in my 24 year career. And what I can say is that this is excellent feedback for us. And, you know, if people are really fired up and angry about our amendment, that's something we really need to either remove or we need to segregate it and vote on it separately. So that the time and effort that we spend in changing the, the CCNR document or the bylaws or whatever we're proposing to change, so that time and effort isn't tanked by one provision that people don't like or don't want or that the small percentage of people that you know, responded don't like or don't want. Um, so I think it's really important for us to listen to that owner feedback and comments and um, to then make good decisions for whatever the final amendments that are gonna be sent out to your homeowners, um, you know, to determine what's in, what's out, what's off to the side as a separate vote, et cetera. Okay, so step four, um, this is one of the final steps. So we need to develop a plan and a reasonable time frame for obtaining approval of the proposed amendments. So the amendment committee and the board, if, if, if the amendment, if you don't have an amendment committee, your board can do this, um, and your legal counsel should create a strategic steps for you know getting to the finish line on um, you know the amendment process. So. You know, one of the first questions I typically ask a board is, you know your community best. How long do you want to leave this amendment out there? Do you want to have the vote in conjunction with an annual meeting where you have higher participation? Um, I have some associations that, you know, they tell me, hey, we can get this vote done in 30 days. 
um, my experiences, normally it does take significantly longer than 30 days um, of having the ballots out there to vote. Um, but you know your community best. I mean, we had an association in the West Valley recently that completed an amendment in less than two weeks. So, um, of course, they didn't have very many uh, lots. It was less than 100 lots, but um, they knew their community and they said, hey, this is a hot topic. We can get this done in two weeks. Um, so we should listen to feedback from your board. Um, have you done amendments before? How you know much participation do you get at your annual meeting? How um, interested are community members in this amendment? So if you are having a lot of problems with short-term rentals and um, people are very motivated to get a short-term rental amendment passed, then it might be a shorter time frame. So this is a good time for us to come up with a timeline and a strategy in terms of how we're going to get the votes. Now, sometimes the board is required to have a meeting um, in order to uh, pass the amendments. Sometimes you can do it all by use of mail-in ballot. So again, it's going to depend on what your document states specifically um, in terms of what your requirements are going to be in order to conduct the vote. Um, do you want to do it in, con in conjunction with a, um, an annual meeting or have a special meeting of the membership for this purpose? Again, we'll have to come up with our strategy on that. Um, the ballots should be mailed to all owners and the progress of the return of ballots should be evaluated by the board at least every 30 days. So typically, when, when we're helping a board through this process, what typically happens is um, you know, the board comes up with a timeline in terms of how long they're going to have the ballots be out there. Um, the ballots are sent to the owners with a cover letter explaining the need for the changes and asking for people to respond right away. Typically, we get about 30 to 40 percent of the ballots back immediately, and people are voting either yes or no. And if our firm is helping a board with the amendment process, um, or maybe they're asking us to have the ballots be returned to our office, um, what we will do is we set up a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, and we start tracking um, who has voted, how they voted, and who hasn't voted. And that starts immediately from the time that the first ballot comes in. And so within the first two weeks, um, we will provide a spreadsheet to the board um, in terms of percentages, how many people have voted, what the current count is right now. And then we'll start making recommendations. Typically we'll say, you know, let's send another communication to the owners that haven't voted. Um, and typically we'll send two or three letters um, asking people to vote again. And as a result of those letters, you should be getting into the 50%, 60% of your owners voting on the issue. And then typically the last, you know, 5, 10, 15% that you need for your association, I call it blood, sweat, and tears. You usually do have to have a specific strategy where you are either leaving ballots at the owners that haven't voted at, on their doorsteps or calling them. Um, to see if they have any questions regarding the ballot, asking them when they'll be returning it. Um, and again, this helps if you, you know, do this in conjunction with an annual meeting because lots of times people are participating in the annual meeting. So it's a good way to get people to return ballots. So um, we should be evaluating the tally on a weekly basis and providing an update to the board um, right up to the time that the amendment um, you know, time frame is, is over. And hopefully if you followed steps one through four, uh, now you're on step five where the amendment has passed. Um, and once you have the requisite vote as you know, identified in your CCNRs, bylaws, articles, um, the next step then is that you have to place the amendment into final format, and then you need to record it within 30 days of receiving the final vote. So again, it's really important to have that spreadsheet updated um, with the results, the tally results of um, whether or not the amendment has passed or not passed. Um, and again, that has to be recorded. The amendment has to be recorded 30 days after you get that last vote. And typically on the amendment, um, the president and the secretary sign the amendment, um, the final amendment language, whether it's an amended and restated uh, document for your association or whether it's a first amendment or a second amendment. Um, and those signatures, if it's in the CCNRs, will need to be um, notarized. And the CCNRs get recorded with the recorder's office in Maricopa County. Um, the bylaws are just placed in the association's files. 
the Articles of Incorporation need to go to the Arizona Corporation Commission. And again, your legal counsel should be helping you with all of this so that you ensure that your documents are, you know, following state law in terms of um, making sure that you're doing the amendments properly and recording them and filing them in the correct place. Um, so that's our five-step plan. Um, again, if you closely follow this five-step plan, your association will be successful um, in amending your documents. So a couple things to think about, um, just some hot topics that I wanted to mention to you that I think a lot of associations in Scottsdale have been contacting us about would be um, rental restrictions and, um, you know, how do we handle rental restrictions? And we even saw an article in the newspaper several months ago about fractional ownership. Some owners in Paradise Valley were um, selling a fractional ownership in their home. And you know, what are some ways that we can implement um, rental restrictions, whether it's short-term rentals, putting in a minimum time period rental? Um, you know, these are hot topics right now in Scottsdale and all around the state of Arizona. So why are they hot topics? Well, in some instances, uh, tenants do not follow association rules um, and restrictions and don't maintain the rental property as well as an owner-occupied owner property. So we're gonna do a quick poll so I can get some feedback from all of you. Um, so the poll question I'm gonna ask for you to respond to is, does your association have problems right now created by short-term rental properties in your community? In our experience, we are seeing a lot of um, questions on short-term rentals, um, specifically Airbnb, VRBOs, um, a lot of different short-term rental properties where people are coming in just for the weekend and maybe aren't following the rules. Okay, so I think we can see overwhelmingly that 53% of your associations that are on this call here today um, are seeing a problem with short-term rentals in their community. Um, and then the second question that we also asked was, do your association CCNRs have restrictions on short-term rentals? Um, and 56% of you said yes, 31% said no. Okay, so some great feedback. So we're seeing problems with the people that are on this call here today. We've got a majority of you have problems um, and some of you have rental restrictions already. Okay, so we'd like to go to just the next slide then, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what are our rights to restrict rentals. So, of course, remember in Arizona, we have the right to amend our CCNRs, um, and as part of that rental, you know, sometimes your association's documents will have a rental restriction. Um, we want to be really careful on um, you know, implementing rental restrictions if you're a planned community or a condominium. So definitely loop your association's legal counsel in as you're discussing um, putting further restrictions on rental properties. So we don't have a lot of cases in Arizona on the ability to um, impose rental restrictions, but um, we do have one case from 2005, which is the Vales case. Um, and then basically in this case, the association um, the court upheld an association's amendment to its CCNRs, um, which prohibited owners from renting their units. Um, and they, they had some certain conditions that as soon as these conditions were met, then the owners would be prohibited from renting their units. So um, they had like a grandfather provision where if you sold your unit, um, you know, after the amendment was recorded, um, you know, that you would no longer, whoever bought your unit would no longer be able to rent if the owner passed away. Um, that would be another reason why they wouldn't be able to rent. Um, if they stopped renting for a certain time period, um, you know, that also was a, a way to implement the rental restriction. So every association, and we're just going to go to the next slide, every association, you know, is, is different. And so you definitely want to talk to your legal counsel if you're a condominium association, because it's very difficult to implement rental restrictions in a condominium association. There's a specific statute which says that you need unanimous consent of your owners um, in the Condominium Act if you want to um, do any sort of a change of use in terms of how the property is being used. And so there, there is a question mark in Arizona as to if you're a condominium and you want to implement a rental restriction, you know, if you want to implement a total rental prohibition in your condo, you're probably going to need 100% approval of your members. If you want to put a minimum time rental, 
um, it may also be questionable if you can just do a regular amendment following your amendment procedure or if you can um, or if you're required to get the 100 percent approval as per um, state law in arizona and the condominium act fortunately if you're a planned community it's significantly easier to implement rental restrictions than it is in a condominium and you typically can just follow your amendment procedure as listed you know at the end of your document um, one thing to remember too, uh, amendments regarding rental restrictions, they need to be in your CCNRs. That's not something that you can put um, into uh, your uh, bylaws or your rules or something like that. That's really a use restriction that needs to be in your CCNRs. And don't forget, um, in order to implement a rental restriction in the planned community, you're definitely going to need to have the requisite approval as listed in your CCNRs. Okay, let's talk a little bit about grandfather clauses, which is our next slide. Um, it's our opinion that associations who are considering adopting a rental restriction may want to have a grandfather clause. And what that means is that um, it grandfathers all current owners um, and they'll be able to rent as long as they're a current owner. But as soon as they transfer title of a lot or unit, to another owner, then that right would, you know, end for that lot. And so why do we do grandfather clauses? A couple of reasons. Uh, rental restriction provisions are usually pretty controversial and um, it's a good way to get people to vote yes um, because it won't directly impact them. Um, it would only impact a future owner of their lot and they're more inclined to vote yes if that's the case. Um, another thing that you can use, um, you know, if, if you're and your legal counsel can strategize with you on all of this, um, you know, grandfather clauses are helpful. Um, you know, you also could put a hardship clause in your amendment saying that the board can override um, any short term rental restriction, you know, amendments that may be passed for um, due to death, disability, or any other cause, um, you know, the board can override the amendment and make an exception. So these are all just some different strategies. And, and as you're doing a rental restriction amendment, we'll go through all of this with you and talk through the different options that your association will have. And if your association is starting to see, um, you know, owners that are listing their property for sale um, in a fractional ownership, which we've seen now in, in Paradise Valley, um, be sure to reach out to our firm because that's definitely a trend that you're not going to want for your association. And we have some language that we can provide to you um, that would be a possible amendment that you may want to incorporate into your documents. Okay, um, a couple other things, uh, a couple other important points, notifying rental owners regarding liability for tenants. Um, you know, don't forget that the association CCNRs are contract between the owner of the unit or lot and the association. Um, therefore, it's really important for the association to notify property landlords of their responsibility regarding their rental unit and liability for the failure of their tenant to, you know, comply with the association's rules or, um, you know, to cause damage to the association. Um, we have an association right now where we have an owner has rented their um, unit to um, somebody who's running a business uh, out of the unit, the tenant is, and it's a very unique business. Actually, I spent some time researching it this weekend. Um, it's a group of TikTokers that are, um, you know, doing TikTok videos out of this particular association. And it's really been extremely disruptive nuisance to the community. Um, and I spent some time just shaking my head, looking at all these TikTok videos this weekend, thinking um, this really is something that is detrimental to this association. And so, um, you know, if you have a situation where you have a tenant that's causing a lot of problems, you know, of course you have remedies. One of the remedies is you can levy a fine against the owner for um, the violations by the tenant, um, or if the tenant damages the common areas, you can charge the owner typically for any damage that that tenant has done. Um, also, you can file a lawsuit against the owner for, um, you know, compelling the owner to take action uh, to rectify any problems that the tenant is creating. Best piece of advice I can give you is if you have problem tenants in your association, reach out to your legal counsel and have your legal counsel call the owner. Um, I can tell you, you know, 95% of the time, 
the issues with the tenant can be resolved with one phone call between myself and the landlord because I just lay it out for the landlord and tell them or him or her, listen, this is the problem. Here's the evidence showing that there's a problem. And this is how much it's going to cost you if you don't rectify the problem. And the landlord's a business person. They get it. And they're, you know, in this business of renting their unit, they don't want to lose money on the deal. So they figure it out pretty quickly within five minutes of being on the call with me. They're, you know, trying to, typically they're trying to hire us to evict the tenant, um, which we can't do. It would be a conflict of interest, but we can provide them with some information of somebody who can help them with that. Okay, don't forget if you are a landlord, you do need to register your rental property with the county. Um, and that's an important tool for associations to know too, if the property is being used as a rental or if it's owner occupied. Um, you know, last but not least, um, the short term rental you know, issue has come about in Arizona, mainly because of a, a new law um, that was passed in 2016, which, and we fully expect that this law is going to be overturned, you know, possibly in 2021 when the legislature reopens. But um, prior to 2016, um, many cities, towns, and municipalities had a provision in their ordinances or, um, you know, their their city ordinances that restricted short-term rentals. So restricted nightly rentals, transient rentals, like hotel type rentals within certain zoned areas that weren't zoned as um, transient or hotel properties. Um, and so pre-2016, a lot of associations were protected from these short-term rentals um, by the city's uh, ordinances or the city's um, you know, restrictions that they had in place. Um, but in 2016, the Arizona legislature uh, passed a law on the state level um, that limited a city, town, or county from prohibiting or restricting the use of vacation rentals or short-term rentals. Um, there are some limited exceptions, but in most cases, that exception is not going to apply to community associations. So basically what happened is the, the state of Arizona took away the right for cities, towns, and municipalities um, from restricting short-term rentals. And they said instead, if associations, HOAs, and condominiums want to prohibit short-term rentals, they need to amend their association's documents to do that. Um, and I think all of us know amending association documents is it's a process, and we need the homeowners approval to do it. So um, it really put associations in a bad predicament because many associations did not have short-term rental provisions because they were relying on the cities, towns, and municipalities. Um, and of course, it's not the city, towns, or municipalities fault that um, the state passed this, this new legislation. So what can we see or what can we anticipate in 2021? Um, in 2020, we saw several bills introduced um, that would reverse this um, legislative law from 2016 and, you know, provide uh, further guidance for cities, towns, and counties on how to restrict short-term rentals in certain zoned areas. Um, however, due to the pandemic, the legislature closed the session early and passed a skinny budget and didn't get back into session in 2020. And so I think we can definitely anticipate in 2021, this issue is gonna be coming to the forefront again. And we'll just have to see where it goes. Make sure you know that you're attending our classes that we're gonna be teaching with the city of Scottsdale in the spring. And we'll be giving you updates on, on the status of this as we move forward. But right now, the law in Arizona um, requires an association to pass a CCNR amendment um, if you're going to implement rental restrictions, maybe you're one of the lucky associations in Scottsdale that already has rental restrictions in place. And then it's just a matter of enforcing them to make sure that the owners are complying with them. Okay, good. Um, just some quick uh, things that I want to mention to you. For those of you who are listening in on our call today, um, we're offering a complimentary free 15 minute review of your association's documents um, as a special service um, after this call today. Um, and basically, if you want us to, our firm would be happy to take a quick peek at your CCNRs, tell you what you need to amend the CCNRs, and give you just very short suggestions on what we think needs to be amended in your documents. So if any of you want to take advantage of that, um, you're welcome to email me at 
bmulcahy at mulcahylawfirm.com. Um, what I'll need you to do is send me a copy of whatever document you want to amend and then um, give us a couple weeks and we'll provide you with that free CCNR review. Um, just some closing points. Um, don't forget that as um, you know, we enter now kind of the holiday months of November and December, um, we don't have a lot of classes, formal classes scheduled um, for uh, free HOA education. Um, but we are planning some classes for the spring with the city of Scottsdale um, and also a virtual uh, neighborhood HOA Academy, again, through our firm and, and many municipalities and cities throughout the valley, including Scottsdale. Um, so be sure that you're checking out our website and our social media to find out more information on that. Um, and we'll be um, announcing the classes, um, hopefully in the very near future, definitely before the end of December. Um, also, you may want to consider our signing up for our monthly mem memo, which we send out that's free information for board members. You can do that by going to our website. Um, don't forget our first Friday free call-in, which Bruce mentioned at the beginning of the call and I also mentioned. Um, that's a great opportunity to ask a question for free, and the next one will be the first Friday in December. And then last but not least, make sure you're checking out our social media. Um, our Facebook, Twitter, and our website, because if there's any important updates that you need to know about HOAs and condominiums in Arizona, um, that's the place that you should go because we are very active on it and we are uh, providing free information on a daily basis, especially you know in, in crisis times like we've had over the past nine months. So just in closing, I, I'd like to just say thank you very much for having me here today. Um, it's been great to teach two classes in this fall. Uh, uh, Academy with, um, you know, the city of Scottsdale, and I look forward to teaching classes again in the future with the Scottsdale Neighborhood College.